data before the emotional picture. So it means your eyes close more, which means people are blinking more. You could also ask a question about uh, which, which direction people tend to look before the picture arises. And that's because uh, right-handed subjects tend to look to the left when answering affective questions. And as shown in the brain here, that when if you simply ask somebody to let their eyes wander and you tell them to think about an emotional picture or to actually look at emotional picture, their eyes will tend to move to the left because the right half of the brain is doing most of the emotional processing. So the question here is, well, do they also look to the left before they see a randomly selected affective picture? So what we're looking at here are the 5% of most calm trials, the calmest of the calm trials that people looked at. And then the vertical axis is lies moving to the left and to the right. Here's where the trial begins. There's where the stimulus is. And the eye moves pretty much flat. It moves a little bit to the left, but not very much for calm trials. But for emotional trials, it actually moves significantly to the left. And of course, once they see the picture, the eye moves a lot to the left, but even beforehand. And what this is important because it means that people are not simply responding to the emotionality of their, their future, but they're also responding to something about the content of it as well. Like the right, ha right half of the brain is going into emotional processing, and their eyes are then tending to move into that direction. These are pretty small degrees of deviation, by the way, but nevertheless, it's a significant result. The other thing that we can look at is we know, as um, who mentioned yesterday, somebody mentioned yesterday that, uh, oh, Todd Richards mentioned that if, if, you're, if you're told to imagine something, and you track how your eyes move, your eyes will move in the way that tracks what's going on inside your head. So it's a way of getting an external objective measure of something which is actually completely subjective, namely your imagery. So if I asked you to imagine a snake, and we tracked your eye movements, you'd get, get some kind of squiggle. If we then asked you to look at a snake, and we track your eye movements, you'd get some kind of squiggle too. And we can then compare them and do a correlation to see the degree to which they match. And so if you do these kinds of experiments, you see a positive correlation between eye movements of things inside your head versus eye movements of things you're looking at in the world. And that allows us in this experiment to see whether eye movements before seeing a picture match the eye movements while seeing a picture. And if that occurs, it suggests that people are not getting just the emotional content, it's not just the brain working, but you're, you're beginning to actually get an image of what you're about to see. Which, which it goes further and further in the direction of uh, you're getting both the emotional content and the actual image of the future itself. So here's the person looking into the future. You get some kind of a squiggle before they look at it and while they're looking at it. And if you take a group of five people, the five people in this experiment who did the worst, they got cl as close to chance as possible, the correlation in the two squiggles that they get is very close to zero. It's a non-significant effect. If you take the five people who show the strongest result, you get a very small but positive correlation, which turns out to be statistically significant. So the answer to the question is uh, yes, weekly. Eye movements before do, do match the eye movements afterwards to a small degree. Well, what does presentiment see? Does it see the probable future or the actual future? This is uh, something that uh, Garrett was uh, leading towards. And I have to acknowledge Anna Borges, who is an intern at IONS, who, uh, who helped me conduct this experiment. So well, what do you see? Well, here's now, there's the future. One thing we might see is when a precognition occurs, we're looking at superposed futures. We're looking at possibilities in the future, but we're able to see them directly, and that's, that's what, what we get back. And because of the uncertainty of the future events, this is why precognition isn't so good, because we're seeing an inherently uncertain future. Another possibility is that there's one single preordained future, but we see it through a glass darkly. We see it through a perceptual process which is distorted. So that's why precognition is not always 100%. And another possibility similar to the first one, where what we see in the present are probabilities of things, and the future is actually completely indeterminate. But in the present, there's always the likelihood of things about to occur. And in this case, precognition is not perfect because there are only potentials of things about to unfold. So here's the original presentiment design where you press a button and there are 600 possible targets, and then sometime in the future, one of them is randomly selected. 
So we do a new design where you, when you press a button to begin, only two targets are selected. One is emotional and one is calm, but they're assigned different a priori probabilities. So when the, when you, the future arrives, according to these probabilities, the target is actually selected. And what this allows us to do then is the following. 80% of the time, by design, the probable and the actual futures are the same, probable to actual. And that, that's what the original experiment was, and it actually doesn't tell us anything new. But the, so we can't distinguish between the probable and the actual future. But 20% of the time, you get a crossover. A probable emotional event uh, becomes actually calm, and a probable calm becomes actual emotional. And under those conditions, we can distinguish between what is, what is pulling the precognition. Is it the probable present, or is it the actual future? So the first case is this. What you're being attracted to is in the present, the probable present. So even if the future turned out to be a bunny, you're going to, be, you're going to show an emotional response because you're looking at a snake, or you're looking at the probable present of a snake. And the other possibility is that it doesn't matter what the probabilities are in the present. You're only attracted to the future event. So when you do this experiment, it turns out that this is the, the case. This line shows the present probable calm turning into an emotional future. And this line shows the probable emotional present turning into an actual calm. And given that the, the uh, way that this is separated, this is a significant difference here. This says that the seer is seeing the actual future and is independent of the probable present. You see why? Because here we are in the present. This is the one that's pulling pupil dilation up even though in the present it was calm. And here we are with a, a probable calm, or a actual calm future, and that is, its uh, pupil dilation is lower. So this is a way of, of discriminating in this kind of presentiment experiment as to what it is that the seer is seeing. They're seeing the actual future. So now this other experiment involving mind-matter interaction uh, at, the, at the quantum level, or at least at, at the level of photons. Uh, you're probably all familiar with what happens if you shine a light through or send electrons through a single slit. You get a particulate form of a distribution. And if you send it through a double slit, you get an interference pattern. This is the way of demonstrating very easily the particle wave duality of, of light. You probably also know then that if you take a system that you present a single electron or a single photon at a time through a double slit, you might expect to get shadows of slits behind it, but in fact you don't get that. What you get is an interference pattern, again showing that there's something inherent in, the, in what appears to be a particle which actually has a wave-like structure. But it's, it's much more curious than that because if you take a double slit system and you get an interference pattern, but now you ask somebody to gain knowledge about which one of the slits the photon passed through, the act of gaining knowledge will cause the interference pattern to go away and to come back and get a, a, a particulate pattern. And this is uh, called gaining which path information. And it's where consciousness gets in to quantum mechanics. And there's no way to get it out, actually. So the act of gaining knowledge about the state of a quantum system collapses its indeterminate wave-like system into, or, or characteristic into determined particles, even after going through the slit. So as uh, Courtney suggested in the delayed choice experiment, it doesn't matter whether you know that the photon is about to go through a slit or it already went through the slit. In either direction, it, it works. Because from the photon's point of view, there's no time. And apparently, from some element of our consciousness, there's no time either. At least we're able to see through time. So I said, OK, that's an interesting experiment. What if we ask somebody with their mind's eye from a distance to try to gain information about where the photon was going? to look at one of the slits and try to gain knowledge. Because the whole thing about remote viewing and clairvoyance is that somehow it seems like you're gaining knowledge from the world somewhere. But you're not through your eye. It's coming from somewhere else. So do an experiment of this type. And the question is, from, from any conventional point of view, you'd expect that asking somebody to put their eye at a distance wouldn't make any difference in here. You'd always get an interference pattern. But if remote viewing is real, then perhaps it would collapse. And you'd, look, you'd see a particulate pattern, even with a double slit. Or maybe you'd get somewhere in between, because remote viewing is not perfect. This, of course, is part of the Schrodinger's cat paradox. I, I won't bother to explain this, because everybody knows it. But the, the, 